So hello everyone and welcome um, to the BASIS Sustainable Agriculture webinar today. This is the final webinar in our sustainability series. Um, so thanks again for joining and, and for those who have attended or, or, or watched back any of the other webinars, I hope you've enjoyed the whole series and, and I'm really excited about this, this final one, which is, I found it hard to name a title for it, but I thought sustainable ag sustainable agriculture in general was it was a good title because um it we are looking at net zero and, and how um agriculture can can have a positive impact on as we work towards becoming a kind of net zero and carbon neutral society so before i get started i just wanted to um have a chat uh, just some housekeeping really um if you have logged in and, and registered with the same kind of um account that you um, registered with then we'll be able to find your email address and your, and your basis registration number and, and we'll be able to sort your points for you however if you joined anonymously can i just ask that you put your q a um into the into the q a box that you can see into the question and answer if you just put your basis registration number then we'll be able to download a report at the end and then we'll make sure we get the one cpd point that's assigned to this webinar um, added to your account if that's okay so just to start with um, and also just to say actually on the q a if you've got any any questions um during the presentation we're going to do a q a panel um at the end which is which will be great um, rather than in between the presentations so if you could um save your questions and ask them at the end and then we'll have a bit of a panel discussion at the end to, to answer any questions that come in but before i introduce our our two guest speakers today I want to just set the scene and kind of explain a bit why we wanted to talk about sustainable ag agriculture and, and net zero today. So hopefully my slides moving on and you can all and you can all see that. So for me, really, what's been so important is that the UK government has, has committed to this to be net zero by, by 2050. And we hear the term net zero all the time, um, either by the government or, or by people like the NFU who are, who are joining us today. But what does net zero mean? Does, does net zero mean no emissions or does net what, what does it actually mean? And, and this is a definition I found was it's achieving an overall balance between greenhouse gas emissions produced and the amount removed from the atmosphere. So I think the important thing kind of that, that says here is it's not we're not going to have zero greenhouse gas emissions. We're not going to be emitting emitting absolutely nothing. But anything we do emit, whether that's as an industry or, or as a country, needs to be counteracted by by what's removed from the atmosphere and this and I'm sure our guest today will talk a bit more about what carbon sinks and, and how that might happen but what was interesting is I, I did a bit of research before this and I was looking at kind of um, how emissions have decreased and as you can see since 1990 overall our, our this is just for carbon dioxide our carbon dioxide emissions have massively decreased in certain sectors especially energy supply which kind of if you look in 1990 was absolutely dominating in terms of carbon dioxide emissions per industry um, but that's significantly dropped now and, and is now um, below transport um, and the other ones that have kind of dropped um, slightly are kind of the business and residential but if you can see in, in the grey um, lower down on the screen so um, the fifth biggest industry emitting carbon dioxide is, is agriculture and actually, since 1990, it's been pretty flat in terms of our emissions. So um, this probably just shows that actually reducing emissions um, it, inherently from agriculture it can be quite difficult. So again, I was doing a bit of research for this and it's a really interesting topic. And when you get into it, you can get a bit obsessed with reading different policies and documents and, and models. And I thought this one was a really interesting one. So this was produced in, in 2018, the end of 2018, so just over two years ago. And it was done by the Committee on Climate Change. And I would say for anyone involved in land management, this has been kind of a really interesting, um, it was a really interesting read. And it was interesting what it kind of focused on. So it was focusing on kind of land use. So this was the first thing I thought was great. It was kind of showing what is land in the UK used for? As you can see, we're dominated by grassland, and especially when you combine that with rough grazing as well, that's um, almost 50% of our land in the UK. We've then got cropping that everyone here will be interested in, but only 26% of the land in the UK is actually the cropped land that we, a lot of our advisors, will look after. 
and then that's combined with urban um, housing um, and forestry and, and other kind of natural lands that might be moorland and peatlands and things like that. But the emissions from the agricultural sector are also shown here and that's that's 11 percent um, but it was interesting here by 2050 it's predicted that agriculture is likely to be one of the largest emitters of CO2. And this report looked at actually land use change more than anything and it looked at how we can use less land for cropping, less land for intensive grassland, and then how we can change that, change the land use to increase the amount of forestry and restore peatlands and things like that. And it really looked at improving agricultural productivity to then um, kind of allow us to change, to release land for, for other uses, which could act as carbon sinks. So it's really interesting here, the kind of changing in diets and a changing in um, agricultural productivity were the kind of two key ones here um, that, that could release land to kind of be used for other for other purposes such as um, forestry or, or peatland and it was really interesting. And as you can see here there's a um, different scenarios they've kind of they've kind of modelled and it shows how by I think it's the BAU one here I can't actually um, remember I'm just getting my notes up here um, but it's the BAU one here, I think, and it just show is the kind of um, best model. And it shows how cropland um, changes and grassland changes, um, but how an increase, how this allows us to release land for forestry and peatland restoration. And the HBP model here, this is the one where we really take action, increase, increase agricultural productivity. We make more from less and also reduce food waste and, and improve diets. And that allows us to release land um, for other uses that can act as carbon sinks. So I thought it was actually a really, really interesting in document. And you can see how this has a significant impact on, on greenhouse gas emissions. So these were the kind of main um, pullouts from these this policy uh, from this modeling. And like I say, there are ways to reduce farm carbon um, emissions from farming practices, but actually releasing land from agriculture to be used for things like forestry and carbon sequestration is actually one of the key ways um, that we can have an impact on emissions. And improving UK agriculture productivity is, is key to this. And actually, this model really targeted those 25% of growers with the lowest productivity. And actually, it said that these growers generally produce 1.8 times less produce than the 25% most productive growers. And it, this was also, I thought was really interesting, kind of looking at our farming landscape, 7% of growers, they farm 30% of the land and produce 55% of the output. So it just shows that kind of, um, there is massive gains for improving agricultural productivity there that can change our land use and free up land to be managed in a different way to kind of have a positive impact on the wider environment and especially looking at climate change. So this might change our kind of farms landscape and how it all looks and land managers might not just be managing cropland but they might also be managing forestry and peatland and um, other agroforestry um, kind of um, habitats as well. And the other really positive thing I thought from this kind of model and, and this publication was it had a real focus on changing the public perception and looking at food waste and potentially even changing diets. And I know there's been a lot of conversation around this and how um, potentially reducing meat and dairy intake can have a positive effect on the environment. But this model was really interesting, actually, and it never focused on a, on a re removal of meat and dairy, but only looked at a slight reduction and a changing in the kind of produce that we eat. And it was really interesting and I just want to give a quick overview of that because I thought the report was um, yeah, it was excellent and um, it gives a real um, feedback on um, a really interesting take on um, how we can have a positive impact on climate change. So we've got two main speakers for the event today and we've got Jonathan Skirlock who um, works for the NFU and he's going to talk a bit more about the Net Zero project that I'm sure some of you have seen a lot about in the press and have probably read through and um, and, and had a look at so that'd be that'd be great and then Jonathan's followed by Charlotte Cook who's an independent agronomist for Indigro and Charlotte before she um, took up a role as a as an agronomist um, did a master's um, and is going to talk a bit um, which really focused on climate change and carbon footprinting on, on UK farms and Charlotte's going to talk us through some of the results she found from that that master's and, and how you can implement those results on, on your farms or the farms that you advise on.
And then finally, I'll just summarise how basis courses are, are kind of helping advisors and growers um, develop these net zero businesses for the future. So I hope that's set the scene and I, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of the webinar today. And um, I'm going to pass over to Jonathan. So Jonathan will hopefully be able to share his screen um, and um, we'll go, off, go from there. Right, uh, well, thanks very much for that introduction, Greg. Um, I'll start screen sharing in just a moment, but uh, yeah, just you know, uh, following on from uh, the, the points you were making about the, the advice coming in from the, the government's own independent advisors, the Climate Change Committee, uh, some of the modelling work which they've done, uh, our role clearly is to represent our farmer and grower members and you know, in, in many ways converge with those recommendations uh, in terms of future agricultural policy, but very much in the context of building on where we already were uh, with uh, agricultural policy. Um, so here we go. You should be able to see this uh, imminently. And Greg or somebody yep. just yeah, comment. Yeah, the first slide is up there. Looks good to me. Yep. Yeah. Great. OK. Um, so, you know, a couple of pictures there just to get you going. Different aspects of the NFU's uh, net zero ambition. Um, the, the, the one, uh, you know, increased um, opportunities for on-farm renewable energy, whether we're looking at anaerobic digestion, uh, solar on buildings or, or um, ground mounted solar hosted on agricultural land. Uh, same kind of thing with regard to Britain's very substantial wind power resources, either um, individual farm scale wind turbines or opportunities just to work with a developer and host wind power on your land and farm all the land in and among it. But many other uh, potential opportunities coming out of bioenergy as the economy starts to decarbonize, as uh, you know, we're now starting to see a turning point, phasing out the use of coal virtually completely, for all purposes, uh, Cumbrian coal mining uh, notwithstanding, um, and the you know the other fossil fuels, the oil and gas use, also being replaced ultimately right the way through into petrochemical products. So uh, bio-based products from our land through the forestry sector, through the agricultural sector, uh, being used to replace many of those relatively energy-intensive or carbon-intensive materials in the economy. Um, the other picture talking about really how we can manage the so-called nature-based climate solutions. So better management of hedgerows, uh, management of farm woodland, uh, you know, the existing trees that are already part of the agricultural landscape, uh, making sure that these things are well measured and in the agricultural inventory uh, for the services they provide. Um, and then further opportunities to enhance soil carbon, not necessarily available to every farm business, but uh, it's important that we understand who can do that. And indeed, you know, perhaps the politically slightly more tricky issue of um, peatland restoration, reversing the degradation of peatlands, um, and then you know, looking at the rather trickier thing of uh, the, you know, the future of farming in the fens on uh, you know, lowland peaty, um, highly organic soils. So this is where we started from, but of course, you know, we've been doing this for many years. Um, the interesting thing really is that in the past we were talking about agriculture not being a problem child, agriculture being very much part of the solution to tackling climate change. But the previous uh, 10 years of my work were largely about explaining to people why agriculture was really rather different from every other part of the economy. Our greenhouse gas emissions are not majority carbon dioxide from energy use. Uh, they're from complex um, biological processes over which we can have perhaps rather limited control. However, around about 2018, it was fairly obvious that the tide was turning, the writing was on the wall. Uh, we were going to have to raise our level of ambition. And that is indeed what happened when um, NFU President Minette Batters announced our net zero ambition at the beginning of 2019. We got that in actually just before uh, the government then received the advice of the Climate Change Committee saying it wasn't good enough to just have a 60% cut in greenhouse gas emissions, it wasn't good enough to have 80%. We were actually going for 100% cut or net zero effectively counterbalancing any residual emissions in the economy with greenhouse gas removals. And so we got in there just about in the nick of time and 
I think we've received a certain amount of admiration for our, our leadership, our, our courage in um, and, uh, responding to what the scientists have been saying. We've got to listen to the scientists if you're going to hear what Greta Thunberg and many other people advocating for this uh, happen. Uh, happen to be saying. Remember, you know, before COVID came along, uh, the most dramatic thing was the number of people out on the streets demanding action on climate change. And so to uh, embrace this idea that early climate action in the coming decade, uh, as well as in the decade to follow with our 2040 uh, ambition, getting there earlier than 2050 is really, really important. And so this um, uh, you know, the graphic just shows uh, the, 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 the strategy brochure, it's a 12 page colour brochure, you can download it from the NFU's website, some people have seen hard copies of this, it puts it in context, this is a global problem, we understand where we are with the UK inventory and the agricultural part of that and how indeed as Greg was saying that before long we may well find that agriculture is one of the more significant um, commercial sectors responsible for greenhouse gas emissions, but we are reasonably unique, uh, perhaps alongside the forestry sector, in that we also have command over opportunities to be a carbon sink as well as a greenhouse gas source. So we can counterbalance our own emissions. We may even be able to do trades in future with other sectors and counterbalance their emissions as well. Um, but it's really important that we have these partnerships. It's really important that we can measure what we are doing. So there it is. In uh, September 2019, after quite a bit of internal debate, um, a strategy was published following minutes in the initial announcement early in 2019. And uh, um, the Welsh language version from NFU Cymru uh, came out the following year. And since then, you know, and, and what I really want to talk about, I'll go back and do a bit of the science in a minute, but we are you know, active already in developing and starting with the delivery of this because you know, clearly there's no point in producing a, a shiny strategy document and then sitting on your hands for a, a year or two because people will come along and call your bluff. Admiration, yes, for setting yourself a challenging goal, but um, people will expect to see actual things happening on the ground. So this came out in uh, August last year in anticipation of COP26, which actually, of course, is not taking place in 2020, but 2021. Um, but it was 26 pharma case studies, NFU members across a wide range of farm sizes, um, farm types, um, different parts of the country, uh, demonstrating what they were doing, their bit for net zero in line with our plan, and I'll say a little bit more about the three pillars of our plan shortly, but the website address is there if you want to go and have a look at this. Um, what was really important though was that almost immediately we embarked mo both on external communications about our ambition, but also internal um, communications, engaging with our members, showing them what good practice looks like, bringing our ideas to life. And then very importantly, uh, you know, particularly given um, Charlotte's following talk, it's about measurement. First of all, what are you doing today? Or what were you doing five years ago, perhaps before you made certain improvements? You've got to understand your baseline for measurement. And then you've got to be able to track how you are potentially changing your business. And so it is very important to understand how um, carbon footprint calculators work, how they uh, particularly incorporate um, the peculiar greenhouse gas emissions from the agricultural sector. And, uh, you know, why? And, and given that there are, you know, 65 different carbon calculators out there, uh, many of them free to download and use, at least initially before you start paying for a bit of professional support. Um, which are the leading ones? Which ones do we think are doing the kind of things that our members want to be able to measure. Um, and you know, to what extent do you really require professional advice in order to apply a carbon calculator to your business? Are you trying to measure the carbon footprint of the whole farm business as a unit? Or are you drawing a boundary around one of your principal commodity products? You want to be able to say, the red meat from my farm has this much greenhouse gas footprint per kilo of live animal weight. Um, or per ton of wheat or per, you know, 100 eggs, whatever it is, uh, your agricultural product. So you can do a product carbon footprint, you can do a whole business 
carbon footprint, but more of that later. Here's another piece of communication that we've uh, launched uh, just recently. I think this came out just before Christmas and we're very pleased at the way it's going. Uh, members are coming forward and just making pledges. They can be uh, you know, roughly plotted on a map. These are not exact postcodes, but they're making pledges across those three areas of our uh, carbon plan. Um, boosting productivity, enhancing on-farm carbon storage, and then engaging in uh, deployment of renewable energy in the bioeconomy to displace greenhouse gas emissions and perhaps actually go carbon negative with greenhouse gas removals. And this is certainly, uh, you know, this is again, it's about the deployment, it's about the delivery of the plan, it's about showcasing what people are already doing on their net zero journey, and it is about being able to go perhaps to a future uh, Secretary of State and slap a document down on the table and say, look at all these farmers right the way across the country. This is uh, a sector which is determined to be doing the right thing. Please, Secretary of State, offer us some help and support because we believe this is the future of our industry. We're being a little bit competitive here, as you can see in the, in the bottom corner of this web page. And you can find this. This is a, a live map on the NFU online website or um, you know, just go out and Google for that uh, hashtag pledge 2040. Um, we're trying to run a little bit of a leaderboard here to see you know, which counties, which part of the UK seems to be doing the best in terms of getting these pledges in. Um, there's about, oh, I to remember the last count, it was, it was certainly well over 250 anyway, last time we looked. We want, ideally, we'd like to get this number up to 1,000. So do advise your clients, uh, your farm businesses you're talking to, uh, get their star on the map alongside all the others. And here's another piece of communication that we're doing at the present time to deliver this plan, engaging with local authorities. Um, clearly, uh, you know, many of the things that farmers want to do, whether they want to boost the productivity and resource efficiency um, by putting up new farm buildings, uh, embracing new technologies for farming, um, or whether they're indeed investing in new technologies like um, solar, wind power, anaerobic digestion, battery storage. It's really important that local authorities, planning departments and others understand how farmers need to be supported in, a, in order to be able to deliver on this. We're certainly hearing a lot at the local level from local authorities declaring climate emergencies and then saying, right, now we want to engage with our local stakeholders and they'll be talking to the local enterprise partnership and other bodies like that. And then they'll come to the agricultural sector and say, right, Mr. Farmer, you know, what are you doing? And we're coming back and saying, well, here is a document. It, it's a, an, an electronic booklet, again, available on the NFU website, aimed at local authorities saying, these are the things farmers want to be doing. These are the things we think you can do to help Perhaps it's through, uh, you know, more, a better um, local food procurement to, um, you know, shorten those supply chains and underpin the profitability of farm businesses, enabling them then to invest in more of the greenhouse gas offsets. Um, wide range of things anyway, but, you know, clearly a different target audience. And then a little bit more about, um, you know, what's coming up. So COP26 definitely happening now this year uh, in Glasgow in November. Um, there's a load of um, propositions being submitted to UK government at the present time uh, with a deadline at the end of next week. Uh, so we're certainly going to be there, um, probably in partnership with many other people in the food chain, in greenhouse gas removal technologies, um, across other um, commercial and industrial sectors. Um, you know, certainly, uh, you know, whatever we hear from uh, the Prime Minister and the Cabinet, um, UK business wants to put on a really good show to the world at COP26. This is, you know, the, the, the first five yearly uh, ratcheting up international greenhouse gas management conference after the Paris Climate Agreement of 2015. Um, and so here is uh, the president of COP26, former uh, Bay's Secretary of State Alok Sharma, visiting a farm last summer um, in Wales, um, going there to do the usual sort of tree planting kind of thing. But the, the man who's hosting him, Clear Jones, um, great guy. I've been on his farm. He has really reinvested in this business. Um, he's got grassland, he's got poultry, um, he invested in oilseed crushing uh, originally to produce fuel, but now I think largely just to produce high quality 
um, um, rapeseed oil. Um, he's got solar on his poultry sheds. Uh, he's got a small hydro system on site. This is a guy who's really trying all of the elements, all of the measures uh, that will help make his business net zero and contribute to the wider national goal. So a bit more about the science now. Um, you saw some figures earlier um, from Greg, and uh, there they are. Um, greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture, um, you know, it's give or take it, it's about 50 million tonnes CO2 equivalent per annum. Uh, it depends a bit whether you're looking at the whole of um, what's known as AFOLU, agriculture, forestry and other land use, um, or whether you're looking at the agricultural inventory completely independent of all the other stuff that gets bundled together under land use, land use change in forestry. But anyway, 10% of our greenhouse gas emissions are carbon dioxide, only one tenth of agricultural inventory from direct energy use in agriculture. So that's heating buildings, um, it's vehicle fuels and the like. Pretty much 50% of it is ruminant methane um, from our ruminant livestock um, and a little bit from the, the handling of their manures and slurries afterwards. And then the balance about um, you know, 35 to 40 percent of the total nitrous oxide um, from labile nitrogen in the soil, whether it's coming from uh, a manufactured fertilizer applied to the land or whether it's um, organic nitrogen um, from just um, you know, plant residues or, or organic um, supplements to the land. The microbes don't care, they just kick it out as nitrous oxide. So the point is these are complex biological processes over which we've got limited control. There may be some interventions over time that we can bring in with advanced genetics or advanced forms of crop nutrition and um, uh, in new kinds of feed supplements uh, for ruminants to try and minimize their methane output. Um, and, and then there's just general good stockmanship. A healthy crop, a healthy livestock herd is going to produce proportionately fewer emissions during its lifetime um, in order to achieve a certain uh, you know, dry weight of foodstuffs produced. Um, but that's where our emissions are coming from. The key thing then is looking at these three pillars, uh, productivity, farmland carbon storage, and the bioeconomy and greenhouse gas removals on top. So first thing, and this has always been an NFU policy ask, we've got to boost our productivity. Um, that's what we want from our new domestic agriculture policy post Brexit, the agriculture transition plan and so on, support so that farmers can uh, get better output for um, managed inputs. And those uh, that, that, that thing that looks like a striped tie there is essentially uh, you know, estimates produced by other bodies like the uh, Climate Change Committee of many small improvements that can be made across different areas of agriculture, perhaps to achieve as much as a 25% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions without compromising food security and output. Secondly, then we're looking at farmland carbon storage, so that's storing carbon in um, farm vegetation and soils, mainly things like um, a bit of increased farm uh, woodland on unprofitable land, better management of existing um, farmland trees and uh, hedgerow trees and the like, uh, growing up hedgerows themselves somewhat larger to act as carbon sinks. Um, all of these things have got to be voluntary recommendations to our members. You know, we don't tell our members how to farm, but we certainly want to offer them guidance on a multiplicity of measures, a portfolio of different things, all of which are going to contribute towards the wider goal. But let's face it, uh, you know, so-called nature-based solutions aren't necessarily going to cut the mustard entirely. They have a certain amount of limited um, size potential. Um, they may, uh, you know, ultimately fill up. Um, and uh, there are issues around permanence and additionality and so on, which is where you're getting into the sort of science and, and uh, policy of measurement, uh, reporting and verification. And so quite a lot of the heavy, heavy lifting has got to be done by displacing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, our own 
greenhouse gas emissions from energy use, but also energy use elsewhere in the economy. We would like to see agriculture given some credit for on farm renewables, providing the electric power or the um, heating fuels um, for many other processes in the economy. And certainly where those processes can be coupled to things that are going to actively take out carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and store it. Variety of ideas out there, uh, and we want to embrace the whole portfolio of them. Um, the biggest one probably is coupling bioenergy to carbon capture and storage, um, but then other things like just in making more use of bio-based products, timbering construction, but also agricultural fibre, sheep's wool, hemp, many fibre crops and so on, bio-based fibres and bio-based plastics and so on, which can replace things that at the moment we get from much more energy intensive, greenhouse gas intensive sources. And then perhaps some novel techniques like spreading charcoal, biochar, as a soil amendment, or enhanced mineral weathering, um, iron magnesium silicates, um, which will take carbon dioxide directly out of the atmosphere and turn them into carbonates in the soil. So there are many different measures there, uh, even in that so-called third pillar. There's a bit more detail about the three pillars and the numbers that we have attributed to them um, as our first guess. These numbers are standing up to the test of time. And I think the whole approach is standing up to the test of time. We've, we're, we're hearing everybody from you know, Microsoft to beer brewers to oil companies, more or less, um, laying out similar kinds of plans. You know, they, they want to reduce their emissions from production, from their contribution to the economy, uh, as far as reasonably possible. And then they want to essentially offset the rest. What makes us different, though, as I said earlier, is that we have that capacity on our own land, 75% of UK land area in agriculture, we have that capacity to store carbon in our land, vegetation and soils, and through processes, so-called engineered greenhouse gas removals, and other things like just displacing the last bits of fossil fuel use elsewhere in the economy, um, in order to counterbalance internally what we're doing and reach that holy grail of net zero. So, uh, you know, I, I don't need to read this slide out, you can read it yourself, but there's a wide variety of productivity boosting measures and advanced technologies and so on, and a number of important preconditions, which I'll come back to later. There are the um, measures that perhaps could form a, a key part of the environmental land management scheme in the future, Although on current showing, we are a little bit concerned that uh, climate change is only one of six themes rather than really being first and foremost the priority in terms of taking climate action and important things like, you know, let's consider using a carbon price to drive farmers and reward them for the delivery of these public goods. And then the third one, very much about how we get on board with other industries that want to use bio based feedstocks and products to make bio-based energy and make it in a carbon negative way or make bio-based products which are going to displace fossil fuel based products or indeed to give farmers novel soil amendments for which farmers will get credit where carbon is actually being stored in the land. So uh, getting near the end now, just a little bit about, uh, you know, the, there's a, a snapshot of our website, some of our recent policy work. Um, because, you know, there are a whole host of government policy announcements, white papers, consultations and so on, um, contributing towards uh, ultimately, you know, a net zero strategy, which is the government's response to the Committee on Climate Change uh, sixth carbon budget report and uh, net zero trajectories that were published in December. Uh, so we responded to a uh, government consultation on the future of low carbon heat. We think that through things like anaerobic digestion in particular, there is very substantial um, capacity to increase the contribution of biomethane, displacing fossil methane in the gas network. Um, it's not going to get us all the way there, but it is a very important growth opportunity to produce both energy and food from our land and help drive down national greenhouse gas emissions by supplying low carbon feedstocks. Uh, then we had um, the Department for Transport consultation. Um, great announcement, um, you know, world beating, let's phase out petrol and diesel vehicle sales by 2030. Um, and, you know, the motor industry seems to be gearing up to respond to this. 
But oh dear, wait a minute, what's the impact on the rural economy going to be? We're rather dependent upon diesel fuel in our Land Rovers, in our tractors, in our machinery, uh, even our quad bikes where we have to run down to the nearest filling station, which is probably going to go out of business now. And it's 10 miles away at the moment and might be 20 miles away in the future. So farmers have got to embrace uh, electric vehicles themselves. And so that brings with it a lot of recommendations. You know, we, we need to see electric machinery rolled out to the agricultural sector. We need to see the availability of electric power and charge points and so on on our farms or in our villages in order to be able to support this transition. Exciting opportunities, but please don't leave the rural economy behind again like you did with digital and, and mobile phone coverage and broadband. And lastly, uh, really rather exciting, Bayes are now consulting uh, a call for evidence on greenhouse gas removal technologies. And this is our chance to line up alongside the, the big boys, the Drax power stations and so on, who claim that they're going to be able to deploy geological storage of carbon dioxide. We want this to be open to the widest possible portfolio of greenhouse gas removal technologies. The nature-based solutions alongside the engineered solutions um, and small scale alongside large scale. That consultation is just closing this week. We're just finalising our response and uh, swapping notes with um, some other important stakeholders at the present time. So there we are, last slide. Um, our policy asks aligned to those three pillars, if you like. So pillar one was all about productivity, remember? So we need support for farmers to invest in new technologies and we need the infrastructure, the digital infrastructure. We've alluded to that previously, uh, as well as the energy infrastructure. You know, if we're going to have a lot of a lot more electric telehandlers, we've just seen one from JCB recently and, and there's another Italian one from Merlot. Um, we've seen the JCB small backhoe. Um, there's a, a case in the United States now, I think, uh, producing a full-sized um, big construction industry back home with a 90 kilowatt hour battery in it. Uh, love to see that over here, but it, it, it hasn't arrived yet. And we haven't quite seen anything more than very small electric tractors either. But if we're going to be using that new machinery, we've got to have the infrastructure uh, to support it. You know, it's all very well having self-guided drones doing your livestock monitoring for you or checking the condition of your crops. Um, but if they need to upload and download digitally, well, you know, we need that um, you know, satellite or, or mobile phone uh, coverage to enable data uploads and downloads. That's what's required to drive productivity and certainly, you know, anything that smacks of the introduction of um, guided and um, semi-autonomous or totally autonomous robotic machinery all needs that. Number two, ask uh, if we're talking about on-farm carbon storage, um, please, DEFRA, consider now the policy framework coming forward about carbon pricing. Let's perhaps see a shadow carbon price used as the basis for the delivery of public goods, carbon storage in our vegetation and soils, because we can certainly layer many other uh, multiple environmental benefits onto the basic task of just storing more carbon in farmland. And then thirdly, if we're going to have this uh, you know, additional opportunity around renewable energy and bioenergy and bio-based materials in particular, we have neglected our domestic bioenergy production for far too long. We've had all this uh, you know, false starts to try and get farmers growing short rotation coppice and miscanthus and other kinds of energy crops. Uh, we've got uh, ministers and, and officials who still don't trust the idea that farmers can responsibly grow feedstocks to put into anaerobic digestion. Uh, we've got to build up that domestic bioenergy economy in order to be able to deliver greenhouse gas removals through the bioeconomy using our own resources on our own land. So there we are. That's who I am, Jonathan Skirlock. That's my address, at least, uh, you know, from maybe huh, May onwards uh, when we start getting back to work rather than working out of our front rooms. And there's a diagram just to show you where we are at the moment. We're not number one source of greenhouse gas emissions in the UK. We're number five. But as Greg made the point earlier, yes, as those other sectors of the economy start to shrink their emissions, we've got to show that agriculture can keep up. Thank you very much for your attention. Happy to take questions later. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks, Jonathan. Oh, oh. I will, 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 I
Um, um, but hopefully well, Charlotte will uh, join, join us now, now and, and um, share her yeah, screen. Yeah. Hopefully my echo will go as well. Perfect. Greg, can so you hope... see that and can you hear me? Yeah, I can both of those. Yeah, I can see you on here. So hopefully everyone else can. So if, if you can't put it in the question box, like we said, but um, yeah, you look good to go to me. Thank you very much. And um, thank you, Greg, for inviting me. And thank you, Jonathan, for uh, such an excellent presentation. I'm going to follow on from Jonathan's presentation and really focus in on looking at how we can actually measure um, greenhouse gas emissions from the arable sector. Uh, so as Greg said in the introduction, I completed a master's last year in sustainable crop production at Warwick University. And as part of that, my research for project was um, a placement with Indigo focused on carbon footprinting of arable systems. So hopefully I will have moved on to the next slide now. Uh, but uh, just as an introduction, I think a lot of people, when they think about measuring greenhouse gas emissions, jump straight to the bottom of this, this slide, which is thinking, well, what are the access to carbon payments from this? However, I think, as Jonathan said, there are so many other benefits and reasons to be measuring our greenhouse gas emissions before we start to think about carbon pay payments. The first, I hope, is that I will demonstrate that there's a nice link between reducing our greenhouse gas emissions and reducing our inputs and therefore increasing the profit margin on our crop production. As well as this, uh, a lot of the practices that reduce our emissions also have the secondary benefit of improving our soils through increasing our soil organic matter. And Ian Gold uh, touched on this in far more detail in the previous Sustainable Soils webinar. So I'm not really going to delve too deeply into this, but I think there's huge benefit in improving our soils from just simply flood mitigation, drought tolerance uh, and improving access to nutrition. Thirdly, uh, as Jonathan said, we can't reach our net zero goals unless we start measuring our carbon footprints and our greenhouse gas emissions. And we are coming under scrutiny and I think we have the ability in agriculture to convert uh, to convert that scrutiny into a really positive outcome. And then as well as this, uh, we are seeing a lot of great change at the moment in our industry. And I think by measuring our greenhouse gas emissions, we're able to improve the resilience of uh, both our clients and also in terms of if you're a farm manager, your own farming businesses. Uh, and I think measuring greenhouse gas emissions is a great way to demonstrate how you are going about this. And then finally, coming on to carbon payments. This is potential. Um, I put the question mark there, not because um, I think it's not going to happen. It is happening. And I think we will see the first uh, payments for carbon coming in this year. Um, the question mark is really because the how, where, what's and why's of carbon payments are still changing rapidly. It's rapidly evolving. But I think we are going to see payments for carbon as a, as a revenue income in the future, potentially from ELMS, but more likely from uh, voluntary carbon markets that we're going to see starting to form. And hopefully in the future, if we can push for a soil carbon code in line with the woodland carbon and peatland carbon codes, we'll be able to produce certifiable credits for our soil carbon that we can trade. So hopefully that's moved on. The aim of my project was to calculate the carbon footprint of a range of arable crops in the UK and compare different methods of reducing our emissions and also increasing potential sequestration. So I started the project in lockdown one, which feels a long time ago now. Uh, and so because of that, I collected all the data remotely. I chose to enter the data into the Cool Farm tool. Uh, there are a number of tools available. I'm not really going to touch on the pros and cons of each of them today because there are a number of other resources out there um, that, that will go into that. However, a couple of reasons I chose the Cool Farm tool. It is one of those uh, most in-depth tools available and it accounts for emissions from fertiliser use and it also accounts for potential sequestration in soils. And as well as that, the Cool Farm tool produces a carbon footprint or a greenhouse gas assessment of a of a of a commodity and in the example of arable production a crop and for me trying to compare the carbon footprint of say a winter wheat crop versus another winter wheat crop that's far easier than trying to compare a whole farm carbon footprint versus another farm where we're obviously going to see far more variation um, for those farms that didn't have accurate data i took up to date soil organic matter testing and I chose to analyse the crops most commonly grown in the UK. Today, I'm just going to briefly, due to time, show you the results from the winter wheat. Um, all the results you will see are reported as carbon dioxide equivalents, and I, I look at them on a per hectare and a per tonne of yield basis. So if you're thinking about assisting your clients, or perhaps as a farm manager, you're thinking about starting to measure your greenhouse gas emissions, 
the data needed is pretty much universal, no, no matter which of the tools you're using. So your harvestable yields, growing area, fertilizer applications, pesticides, and your energy use tend to be the typical information you need. And it's all tends to be accessible on farm management software. As well as this, depending where you draw the boundary of, of your study, you may also want to include transport off farm. As Indigo, we have become members of the Cool Farm Alliance, and that's given me the opportunity to aggregate all of the data from our farmers that took part in the study to form a benchmarking group. Before I touch on those results, um, I think it's really important just for me to clarify why I've kind of broken down total emissions into these two values so that it makes sense as I go through the presentation. So a carbon footprint is obviously the total greenhouse gas emissions associated with an entity, which in arable production is the production of a crop. And that, those emissions are made up of indirect and direct emissions. So indirect emissions would be from the production of the products that we're using, such as our pesticides and our fertilizers. And then the direct emissions are actually from the use of those. And in most industries, this carbon footprint value here is likely to equal the total emissions value. However, as has already been explained, in agriculture, we have this fantastic opportunity that we can actually alter our, our carbon stocks and therefore we can build up the amount of carbon we're sequestering in our soils and tip this total emissions value hopefully into a negative so that our crops become net sequesters of carbon uh, not only improving our business resilience but also maybe in providing a source of income in the future so the first thing i did was i took all the data from the cool farm tool and calculated the carbon footprint per hectare of winter wheat you can see on the left hand side uh, as emissions and then along the bottom the farms are all numbered anonymously uh, where there's two of the same number that's because they entered two crops of winter wheat into the study looking at the highs and lows of the graph you can see that there's large variation if i just take farm 13 and farm 15 as a comparison uh, some of the practices that are different between the two Farm 13 used a far greater amount of synthetic nitrogen fertiliser than farm 15. In fact, farm 15 used around 150 kgs of synthetic fertiliser and they also used the addition of sewage cake. And in general, organic amendments do tend to have lower emissions. As well as this, some of the differences between the carbon footprints are also seen through the use of nitrification inhibitors and a reduction or an increase in fuel use and crop protection products. The same can be seen when we look at the carbon footprint per tonne. Again, you can see large variation. Uh, for winter wheat, the carbon footprint per tonne tends to be a tenth of the carbon footprint per hectare. Again, if I look at farm 15 and conveniently farm 16, just to demonstrate, you can see that farm 15 has a much smaller carbon footprint per tonne. And this is, starts to be where yield comes in. Um, so farm 16 actually that year produced an eight tonne yield, whereas farm 15 produced a 10 tonne yield. And that's why uh, that accounts for some of the difference in the carbon footprint per tonne. So why is it important that I've compared the carbon footprint per hectare and the carbon footprint per tonne? So you can see here that if we look at farm 13 and farm 16, you can see that there's a role reversal. So whilst farm 13 has the greatest carbon footprint per hectare, uh, farm, 13, uh, farm 16 actually has the greatest carbon footprint per tonne of product. And this is really important because it comes back to Jonathan's point earlier that obviously uh, there is tends to be an association with, with higher inputs linking to greater productivity. And you can see that here that uh, this, is, this is yielding higher which is likely why it had higher inputs in the per hectare category. However, the interesting thing is that there's a number of farms that are producing um, their yield using lower emissions per tonne. So this suggests that there's still the potential for farm 13 and a lot of the other farms to reduce their carbon footprint per tonne of product without necessarily having an impact on yield. And that comes into play when I look at some of the key results of my project. So one of the first key results was that there was no correlation between emissions per hectare and yield. So you can see, for example, two farms here producing an eight and a half ton yield using vastly different emissions per hectare. When we think of that in a practical sense, where do we want to be on the graph? Well, clearly we want to be producing a high yield using low emissions per hectare. And whilst we should always be pushing for the greatest possible yield, a realistic concept of yield is also important because if you're only going to be achieving an eight tonne yield for whatever reason, for all the external factors that we all know go into producing a crop, then ideally, obviously, we want to be producing it using the lowest emissions because that suggests we're using the lowest inputs and therefore the lowest cost is going into that crop and the greatest profit margin will hopefully be seen. 
So the next key result of the study was the positive correlation between nitrogen use and emissions per hectare. So you can see as the sum of total nitrogen increases, so does the carbon footprint per hectare. Now, this is, um, as already touched on by Jonathan, simply because synthetic nitrogen use contributes so highly with our nitrous oxide emissions to the carbon footprint. And in fact, across all four crops in my study, over 50% of the carbon footprint was made up of synthetic nitrogen use. And finally, you can combine kind of combine these two graphs to show that whilst there was a weak positive correlation between total nitrogen use per hectare and yield, I think more interestingly is looking along this line here at what would have been a traditional 220 kgs of application of synthetic fertilizer. You can see that there's huge variation in the yield from some crops yielding eight tons a hectare and some pushing nearly 12 tons. And this variation suggests to me that there's the potential to reduce our synthetic fertilizer or at least optimize our application of it, which would reduce our emissions without having an impact on yield. So the next stage of the project was to look at the carbon stock changes. And as I touched on earlier, that's the potential of our soils to sequester carbon. And the Cool Farm tool calculates carbon stock changes through a combination of carbon accounting and carbon measurement. Carbon accounting is an estimation of our potential of our source potential to sequester carbon based on different practice changes such as tillage, land use and cover cropping. And then this is combined with carbon measurement, which is the specific measurement of our soil organic matter. Now, currently in the UK, there is not one set method of measuring potential sequestration. And I could probably have entered this data into a number of different tools and I would have got vastly different results. The important thing is that we know that the practice changes implemented do have a positive impact on increasing our soil's potential to sequester carbon. And when we come to look at the farm's results, you can see this. Um, so along the bottom, we've got carbon stock changes and then the farm numbers along the right hand side. And you can see that there's huge variation in our farm's ability to sequester carbon. Uh, those uh, farms here, you can see 10, 11 and 17 that have a zero value. They are in what I would probably be classed as traditional uh, conventional cultivations and management practices. Um, and that therefore means that they have a, a zero, according to the Cool Farm tool, for their ability to sequester carbon. However, if we come to look at the opposite extreme, uh, Farm 4 in this case, they've made a lot of management practice changes transitioning towards a regenerative system. So in this example, this farm um, has a soil organic matter of 10, and they're also in no tillage, uh, so direct drilling and cover cropping scenario. And they've been doing both of those things and transitioning to re regenerative practices a long time ago, which means they have this great ability to sequester large amounts of carbon. And this is really exciting because the two combine to produce our total emissions. So if you follow through Farm 4 and Farm 13, you can see that Farm 4 has a much smaller carbon footprint and it also has much greater potential sequestration. And therefore, um, farm four becomes a net sequester, according to the Cool Farm tool, of six tonnes a hectare of carbon dioxide equivalents for their winter wheat production. Whereas farm 13 is a net emitter of around three tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalents. And this red value is the really exciting value in agriculture because this value is the potentially tradable value in future. Uh, looking forward for our clients and also if you're a farm manager out there, this is maybe the value that you're going to be able to, to sell. But more importantly than that, it comes back to my second slide that there are going to be so many more benefits to your farming system from from being in a net zero uh, and net sequest sequestering system before you even think about carbon payments. So how can we achieve this? Well, I really like this decision tree because I think it just sums up nicely some of the key strategies we can incorporate on farm. So. Firstly, uh, can we look at in introducing cover crops into the rotation? Cover crops are brilliant because they have multiple benefits. They not only prevent emissions from the soil, but they also help sequester carbon through photosynthesis. As well as this, can we look at our fertilizer use, reducing the rate of fertilizer we're using, and if we've re reduced it to the, the most that we can, also looking at improving the timing, application, and potentially using a nitrification inhibitor and in enhancing our fertilizer efficiency. As well as this, can we look at reducing our tillage practices to a reduced or no tillage system? Think about our rotation. There's been a number of studies published that demonstrate that a more diverse rotation is likely to sequester more carbon. And again, with our cover crops, thinking about the cover crop species we're growing, 
if we're growing them to sequester carbon, we should really be looking at those C4 species that are going to make the most advantage of the sunlight we have at that time of year. And finally, adding organic amendments. And in the case of um, this decision tree, it only mentions compost and biochar, but that I think there's so much more value to things such as farm new manures, slurries and biosolids that are really going to help boost that organic matter and also condition the soil so that we can think again uh, about reducing our economic fertiliser applications because there is more nutrients available. So thank you for listening. I hope that that was useful. I apologise it was a bit of a whistle stop tour due to the, uh, having my eye on the timings. Um, but I look forward to questions. Thank you. Thanks, Charlotte. That was um, fantastic. And I'm just going to um, summarise now. But um, kind of some of what I was going to talk about now, I don't know if, if, all, if you've kind of seen um, these webinars before. This is the kind of bit where I kind of summarise how BASIS gets involved in the, in the topic that we've covered in this webinar. But I think both our speakers today have really kind of stolen my thunder a bit because I wanted to talk about how facts and fertilizer applications and optimizing them can, can potentially reduce your carbon footprint, how the beta conservation management generating new landscapes and farm land use um, can have that impact as well. Hedgerows and, and forestry like um, um, Jonathan spoke about. I was also going to talk about the quality of soils and the, and the soil and water courses, but I feel like Charlotte's already uh, covered pretty well how important it is that we manage our soils and what opportunity there is there for kind of increasing organic matter and um, reducing um, the, the overall carbon footprint of, of producing a ton of wheat. So I really think uh, both our speakers today have done a fantastic job in kind of um, selling the importance of training, education and upskilling and having that holistic kind of integrated approach that people, advisors and farm managers have who have worked towards the basis diploma. Because really, I think my takeaway message from from both our speakers today is there's not one solution and actually produ having productive farmland and, and having a sustainable productive farming system which is um, producing kind of more from less of what we currently have and effectively managing um, how we do it and optimizing it but also effectively managing the land that um, is released because of that increase in productivity is the way we're going to um, have a really positive impact and um, yeah I hope you guys can see how the kind of um, integrating a holistic approach to training that BASIS provides kind of works with that as well. So like Charlotte said we're going to finish with with questions now. I've already got a big list kind of written down so I'm going to um, try and get through as many as we can. I know we said we'd kind of this is this webinar I'll finish at about five but I'm going to hopefully if you two don't mind we'll keep going for another five or ten minutes and just get a few a few questions answered. Um, I'm going to pick out the ones that I think probably haven't been covered as, as much. And um, the first one, this I think is probably for Jonathan because it kind of focuses on the, the farmer's role. But with this kind of um, net zero and being sustainable is so important kind of for the end market and the consumer now. And there's so many brands um, trying to promote their products as sustainable and, and environmentally friendly. But if this is going to cost the farmer by taking land out of production or potentially having to change their machinery to, to electric vehicles or implement infrastructure, things like that. Do you think the supply chain is going to support the farmer by paying them more for potentially a net zero produced product, which then it charges the end market more? But, but will that money come to the come to the farmer? What's your kind of opinion on the end market supporting the farmer? Well, we're certainly starting to hear from some in the processes and retailers saying that they are committed to selling um, low carbon or net zero products in the future. Sadly, so far, we haven't really seen very much in terms of premium price in the market for um, you know, agricultural commodities which have been carbon footprinted. Um, part of what we've got to flag up to our own members is that, look, guys, this actually is the new normal. Um, you know, more data is going to be asked for um, from others in the supply chain. We'd really like to see that turned into a two-way street, though. Uh, you know, rather than the idea that you know, like cattle tracing and so on, that uh, farmers are just supposed to supply data and then they never get any feedback from it. No, it it does need to be a two-way process. So, for example, um, you know. 
farmers you know selling um livestock may well be given feedback to say well you know the, yeah that batch of carcasses from that particular herd were really good um you know their their carbon footprint came out great according to our score um or you know their their carcass quality was excellent give us more of those and that then perhaps can inform a local breeding strategy for the farmer so i think you know more feedback of data up and down the supply chain and, and remember you know we're talking i was talking earlier about data some of that probably does mean that yeah far, the farmer's got to have uh you know an app on a mobile phone that can receive data back from the supply chain and and help with um local herd management um so you know the data infrastructure becomes increasingly important in the future but the you know the short answer to the question i'm afraid is that um, you know, while we anticipate that there may be ultimately a net zero premium price, we haven't yet really seen signs of it in the marketplace. OK, and the next question I've got is going to be for, for Charlotte, because it's looking at kind of you've shown how we can measure and you kind of you showed that one farmer who was producing a ton of wheat and was kind of sequestering a lot of um, a lot of carbon. But how far are we off? him that farmer being able to trade that carbon that he's sequestered and, and there being a price for a kilo of carbon dioxide uh, it, it's a it's a it's the com most common question i think and i think in terms of a certified credits that we can trade we're really going to need to push as an industry from uh, hopefully organizations like the nfu and cla are going to push for a soil carbon code because that will enable us to have a verified method of accounting for our carbon in our soils which will allow us to produce a credit that we can trade that other industries can offset using so uh, similar to the woodland and peatland carbon codes at the moment However, in terms of the voluntary initiative, there are a number of companies out there, some already in the UK that I'm aware of, that are producing carbon certificates and they're doing them based off tools such as the Cool Farm tool and uh, using soil scanning and, uh, and other methods. And those certificates can be used on a voluntary carbon market to sell to, sell to industry. And that is happening already, uh, only very recently really, but it is happening this year. And I think we are gonna see a, a, a build-up of that market um, in a very rapid way going forward. But Charlotte, I would come in here and say that you know we're slightly nervous about the focus on exclusively soil carbon. We are aware that both the Climate Change Committee and DEFRA are not completely convinced that soil carbon enhancement is something which can really be measured and traded at the present time. Um, and it's certainly not necessarily something which is uh, equitably available to all farmers. You know, for, for some farmers, carbon is a little bit like an albatross around their neck. You're farming in the uplands, you've got high uh, organic uh, carbon stocks in the soil, but you can do relatively little in terms of management or uh, practice interventions to enhance those soil carbon stocks further. Clearly, yes, you know, if you're taking on an arable farm that's been badly managed in the past, there may well be opportunities to significantly boost soil carbon in a relatively short time. But you know, somebody needs to be able to come along and audit this. Um, we, we've got Mark Carney look, uh, setting up a task force on uh, you know, enhancing and bringing higher standards into the voluntary carbon market, um, both nationally and internationally. And, um, you know, the big investors and, and fund managers and so on are going to want to do due, due diligence on all of this. Um, so, you know, really robust ways of measuring and auditing have got to be developed. Um, it, some of this may well be, you know, I think in, in terms of public sector support for farmers doing the right sort of thing, uh, payment for public goods could be based upon proxy indicators so you're you know you are applying the right kind of soil amendments you're changing your tillage practice in a way that which is likely to enhance soil carbon um, and therefore perhaps you could get that and in the form of an annual payment but it, the, the process itself must be subject to an audit um, every five to ten years somebody would have to go around and take you know thousands and thousands and thousands of soil samples to show that uh, on those farms where soil carbon was meant was supposedly being enhanced it was actually measurable but you cannot measure from one year to the next an improvement in soil carbon you can only predict it with a model i think based on both your kind of answers to that and the questions that have come in what's interesting is 
it seems like advisors and farmers want to do the right thing but it's kind of how can they get rewarded to that and have a kind of financially sustainable business is that money going to come from the end market is that money going to come from other industries through carbon trading or, or is that money going to come through um governmental support and i think that's probably the bit that's probably the most unsure at the minute from my kind of opinion and so, you know i think we'll probably see both public and private sector um opportunities for carbon reward payments but uh, you know it's a lot easier to pay that for um you know an an, an audit of new woodland established on previously relatively unprofitable farmland or certainly for um, something which can be physically measured with a farm walkthrough or lidar or drone monitoring or something like um, the status of your hedgerows so i'm going to have one final question before we kind of um wrap up um, and it's going to be another one for you jonathan so we spoke about electric vehicles but kind of biomethane and bio biofuels is that are they a kind of an alternative to electric vehicles on farms where you say kind of de developing the infrastructure is more difficult? Well, we, a new, oh, I was going to say, and, and another addition to that is yeah. you said there was some scepticism about potentially biofuels by the government and the, and the public. How can we change that perception and show that farmers can kind of produce biofuels in a, an economically um, economical way? Well, the good news on biofuels is that we've just we've just had an announcement that the government is going to um, allow the widespread introduction of E10, 10% ethanol blend fuel, which will mean a restart for some of the UK ethanol processors. Um, but that industry has, you know, rather failed to reach its potential because of only half-hearted support. Um, you know, a lot of concern and you know in, in some cases are rather unjustified food versus fuel type concerns being raised um the answer is not instant electrification because electrification of the vehicle sector is something which is coming rather gradually and that's why it is really important to be able to support the legacy vehicles um, with biofuel blends or or even you know high blends i've i've been driving around for the last 10 years in an, an audi diesel that runs on veg oil it's eminently possible, um, but pure veg oil is not necessarily the, the, you know, the, the best yielding fuel from the land. It is an option, though, that we wanted to see supported in the past. And, and, and I mentioned um, Clear Jones with his um, veg oil crusher, which he was operating with a couple of other Welsh farmers. Uh, you know, there was a passing interest in this, but the admin burden from paying fuel tax and the lack of government enthusiasm to uh, see uh, you know, a, a greater market share taken by bio-based fuels um, you know, certainly put the dampers on that industry. There may be opportunities, you know, niche opportunities for things like heavy goods vehicles and um, large heavy tractors, um, you know, for heavy cultivation um, or you know, really big sprayers and combines and so on. Um, with biomethane as a vehicle fuel. Um, there are some opportunities for biomethane at the present time under the existing renewable transport fuels obligation. Um, but, uh, you know, we've got to be careful here, uh, thinking VHS and beta max and keyboard layouts and so on. There will be a technological lock-in to vehicle electrification and, and we're certainly seeing um, significant moves now into um, the the truck and bus market and the construction and mining and agricultural vehicle market for at least small and medium sized electric vehicles. Thanks, Jonathan. And I'm, I'm going to wrap it up there, actually, because we said we kind of finished by by five. But if anyone has got any further questions, then my um, contact details can be found on, on this slide that you can see now. So I'd be more than happy for you to send, um, drop me an email um, and I'm sure Charlotte and Jonathan would be happy for me to forward on any questions and um, I'm sure they'll be happy to, to answer them or provide any links or, or further information that you might need. So thanks everyone for joining us today. Thanks to Charlotte and Jonathan. I think that's been fantastic and um, I hope you've all enjoyed not just this webinar, but, but all the webinars we've run over, over the winter period. Um, and, and thanks everyone who, who's attended. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you.